Hello, Bitter here. Today I'm going to be doing a review of the Nintendo Famicom Mini. This is a fun little system that was released in 2016. It's very similar to the Nintendo Mini, but also so, so different. After I do that review, I'm going to be installing a small Bluetooth chip to see if I can get Bluetooth wireless controllers working on the system. This is probably a horrible idea for a punch out, if any of you know that. But who likes wired controllers? And honestly, it's very worrying with the system because there's gonna be no way to replace the controllers if they start going bad. You can probably install the pads, but that's about it. If the board starts going bad, you're, you're screwed. And after that, we're going to try hacking the system and see if we can install some separate software on there. So if this sounds interesting to you, stick around and we're gonna get started. All right, let's unbox this sucker. This is the Nintendo Classic Mini Family Computer and Family Computer down here in Japanese. In here it states that it has the HDMI cable, a USB cable, and a manual. It includes 30 games and has two controllers. Let's take a pause for a second. I want to show the timeline of the Famicom here so you get a better go. idea of how the games came about. The Famicom originally came out in 1983 in Japan. With its combination of Ricoh chips for high-definition graphics, it was a runaway hit. It would still be a few more years before Super Mario Bros. released. However, that happened to coincide with the release of the Nintendo Entertainment System on October 18, 1985. Cosmetically different from the Famicom, it was meant to look more like an appliance and less like a toy. Regardless, the innards were mostly the same. One year later, the Famicom Disk System was released. This amazing add-on not only added more power to the Famicom, but it also had the ability to load 112 kilobyte discs that were also writable. This is when Nintendo delved into open world games where you could save your progress and play another day. Ghosts and Goblins released on the same year, and the size was already larger than the size of the Famicom discs. Ah, oh, what did I waste my money on? Is this a Sega system? The Famicom Mini is the amalgamation of all this history. On the back, we have the list of games. Mario... Uh, Super Mario Brothers, Mario Brothers, Donkey Kong, Ice Climbers, Excite Bike, Rockman, Downtown Netsuketsu Monogatari, this is um, River City Ransom, Balloon Fight, um, Iyaru Kung Fu, Kung Fu game, Pac Man, I need to play that, um, Makai Mura, I hate this, is, this is Ghouls and Go or Ghosts and Goblins, I hate Ghouls and Goblins, Gradius, Solomon's Key, uh, Tsupari Dai Sumo. This is a sumo game included on the system. It's extra interesting because it was also included on the Super Nintendo game, or on the Super Nintendo Mini in Japan. Not included in the American consoles though. Uh, Super Mario Bros. 3, Final Fantasy 3. This is Final Fantasy 1 on the Nintendo Mini. Uh, Gal Galaga, Mar Dr. Mario, Alantis no Nazo. I don't know this game. I thought this was Super Pitfall for a minute, but it's not. Oshino Kirk Kabi, this is uh, uh, Kirby's Adventure, I think. Um, Downtown Netsuketsu Shinkyoku, another um, River City Ransom style game. Uh, Zelda, Metroid, Dracula, um, Castlevania actually. Uh, they call it Akuba Jo Dracula. Uh, Link's Adventure, uh, Ninja Gaiden, Mario Golf, this is only in the Japanese version. Super Mario USA, which is the Super Mario Brothers 2. Uh, Double Dragon 2 and Contra. So there are different games on the Famicom Mini compared to the Nintendo Entertainment System. I'll go over a few of them. The fun ones for me are Final Fantasy 3. Unfortunately, if you don't speak Japanese, it's not very useful. Uh, River City Ransom, which I don't think is on the Nintendo Mini. And um, Solomon's Key, which I did play when I was younger. I never owned it. It's nice to be able to play it again. On the other hand, I am really sad about some of the other games that are missing. I'm actually surprised they're not on there. Kid Icarus, I never actually played through it, but it is on my list of games to play through. Punch Out, I love that game. I come back to it about every five years or so and beat it again. Star Tropics, that's one of the last NES games I bought. It's not, it didn't blow my mind, but it's good general fun. Here is a full list of games that were added with English names. And here are the games that were replaced from the Nintendo Classic Mini. These games come in their Famicom disk drive versions. All right, let's try opening. Oh, 
Inside, we have the system with the two controllers here attached. It includes a few cables, which I have never personally used, which is why they're still in here. And then the instruction booklet, the thin instruction booklet. This should be very similar to the American version. Now look at this baby right here. It doesn't move the eject button. We got a reset, the power button. So on the back, we have an HDMI port and a micro USB port. It is uh, pretty generic on the bottom. These little pads are likely where the screws are hidden for taking this apart. This is the expansion port. While it looks similar to the NES controller ports, it has more pins, so you can't plug in the same controllers. One of its purposes is for plugging in a keyboard for programming. Yes, the Famicom had its own version of BASIC. With a splitter, you can also use it to plug in two external controllers. It was also used for light gun games. But yeah, duh, duh. it's non-functional, much like the extension ports for the Mega Drive. Now if you take a look, you can actually place the controllers on the sides. So there's actually a way to put away your controllers in the Japanese version of the NES. It's not terribly tiny. If you're playing a game like Castlevania, it can be a little bit awkward to hit directions without going diagonal, but this feels like standard buttons for a Nintendo controller. Now, the fun part about comparing this is if you look at a Switch controller, they're actually very similar in size. In fact, the Switch face buttons are actually smaller than the Famicom Mini. It's almost like this was a little bit of a test bed to see if the Switch controllers are too small. I like it, but Unfortunately, because these are hardwired, you can't ever get any replacement controllers, and that is a concern compared to the Nintendo Mini. I'm sure you can replace the pads. I'm going to try to be gentle, but these are small, a little bit hard to push. We'll see how long they last. Last, um, I also want to mention that there's a mic on here. This mic is non-functional, and so the Legend of Zelda, um, in the Japanese version, you would blow into it. Like that. And that you would use to defeat what pulls voice. In some ways, the Famicom Mini looks more like 70s tech than 80s tech. You might think the Magnafox Odyssey came out in the same generation, but there's about 10 years between them. And yes, this is the Famicom Mini. Let's plug it in. We are now at the game selection screen. Simple, but functional. You can scroll left and right to choose different games on the system. The game list will scroll along with your selection. The top list of icons allows you to customize your system. The monitor icon configures the display of the game. You can choose between analog television, 3x4, or pixel perfect. The second icon allows you to configure a track mode, which will show demos of the games after a period of being idle, automatic shutdown, which will cause the console to turn off after being idle for an hour, and LCD burn-in protection. The button on the bottom allows you to reset your system to factory settings. The next icon shows the licensing agreements of the software. The left-hand side is the intellectual property of Nintendo. All of the included games have their copyrights written here. Now, if we go to the right-hand side, we'll see that there's an open source license section. This software is highly likely to be running a Linux kernel, which also probably explains the GPL version 2 licenses. The last icon shows a QR code which will link to Nintendo's official website with instructions for the system. Opening the QR code will show a page much like this. Once you click a game, it'll show the original manual as a PDF. Pretty slick. This is the kind of thing that causes nostalgia. You could even download the manual and store it offline if you wanted. There also happens to be another hidden menu on the screen. If you press down, you can access the save states. You may have noticed that the artwork for the games is sometimes in different sizes. The long horizontal games are games that came on Famicom cartridges. The long vertical games were generally international releases, and the square games are Famicom disk drive games. Okay, wait a minute. Now. I know a lot of the people who are watching this won't really have a real idea of what the Famicom is, the history is, and all the different revisions. So I'm thinking to get the most out of this Famicom mini review, let's head out to Akihabara and check out some real systems. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. All right, let's go. Okay, we arrive in Akihabara. We're going to be looking for some Famicons and some games. Got some Famicom games. It's a 
pretty small compared to the American ones. Here is that Netsuketsu, another one. Looks like we found the Famicom Disk System. You doing a piece? Mitai. This is the same game as they have on the Famicom Mini. I've never actually seen these before. They really do look like little floppy disks. This is an example of a peripheral that uses the Famicom Mini's extension port. And there are the Famicoms. Just wait a minute. Oh, no, no, size no Famicom. なんか初めてだな。うん。コントローラー、インテンドと一緒だね。まあ、おもちゃだね。はい、戻そう。手を買わないよ。でも、あるのは嬉しい。これ、インテンジャーズ・トルズ・ゲームズ。わお。Cartridge part. Front and stick the disc in. Wow. All right, we finished our looking around. Let's head back. That was a fun trip. I always love heading out to Akihabara. They have a ton of classic games and different consoles out there. But now, now that we're back, let's check out what's on this Famicom Mini. That's right here. Let's get to it. How about we try a game? Here is Mystery of Atlantis, released by Sunsoft in 1986. Coming one year after Super Mario Bros., it claimed that it had surpassed it. It doesn't look too shabby, but it never made it stateside. I guess Sunsoft was focusing on the comic book games in the US. I personally don't trust a game where the birds attack you by pooping on you. Better than Super Mario Bros.? I'll leave that for you to decide. Here is Super Contra, released by Konami in 1990. If you come from the States, you might better know this as Super C. It's mostly the same as the US version. If you had the European version, Robotector, a lot of the humans are replaced with robots. The most notable change for the American version is that the level select code was removed. Hardcore for the Americans. Okay, one small note. Trying to press diagonal in this game is really hard. You have to press hard and it starts to hurt your fingers. This is the athletic competition spin-off of River City Ransom, released in 1990 by Technos. River City Ransom had a whole series of games that never made it over here except for the original. Where the main character is known as Kunioku. I'm not going to dig too deeply into this one, but it obviously uses the same engine and looks like it would be a ton of fun if you played two-player. And it goes up to four players. Let's see if we can find the actual River City Ransom. River City Ransom was originally released in 1989 by Technos. The biggest surprise that you'll see is the clothing change. The clothing in this game is modeled after Japanese school uniforms. I gotta admit, this is still a ton of fun in Japanese. But if you can't read the Japanese, you probably won't know the next area that you're supposed to go to.
Here's the US version of River City Ransom for comparison. And yes, everyone wears jeans in the United States. Let's next jump to Metroid, released in 1986 by Nintendo on the Famicom Disk System. I'm going to cut down on the load times after this game because they they are a bit long for watching. But for this first one, I want you to get an idea of how long it takes to load things. Metroid has a very similar save select screen as Legend of Zelda. And that makes sense since they all came out in the same period on the Famicom Disk System. I would say this is mostly the same as the US version, except for some specific sound effects in the music. You'll find this as a pattern for the other Famicom Disk System games as well. Here's the US version of Metroid for a comparison. Next, let's check out Super Mario Bros. 3, released in 1989 by Nintendo. Yes, you might find some small differences in the background, but that is by far not the most interesting change in this game. What do you think happens when you stack a leaf power-up on a mushroom power-up and then you get hit? It works just like Mario 1, you become small. Here's the US version of Super Mario Bros. 3 for comparison. This is Castlevania for the Famicom Disk System, released in 1986. Being able to save in Castlevania is a real game changer. This game in the States was a marathon. But with being able to save, it's now separate challenges where you can just keep doing the same level over and over again. Comparatively, in the US version, if you lose all of your lives, you die and you have to go back to the beginning once you have no more continues. That's just not a thing in this game. And now, the US version for comparison.
The Legend of Zelda was released in 1986 by Nintendo on the Famicom Disk System. It's very similar to the US version other than the load times. The sword shooting sound is also pretty interesting. Here's the US version of Zelda for comparison. The Legend of Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link was released in 1987 by Nintendo on the Famicom Disk System. This game, just like the others, has some different sound effects, but it also has some mildly different graphics as well. If you notice, the water outside is animated. And the graphics for the enemies on the overworld are a little bit different. Here's the US version of Zelda 2 for a comparison. is Tsupari Ozumo, released by Tecmo in 1987. What I've generally found is if you keep pressing forward, you will win a lot of the beginning matches. This game is made for those kids who've seen Sumo on TV and are like, wow, I can do this on a video game. But if you don't really watch Sumo, you're probably not going to be all that much into this game, in my opinion. And if you hit start, you get a guy sweeping the arena.
Final Fantasy III was released by Squaresoft in 1990 on the Famicom. There's a ton of text in this game, but let's see if we can get to a battle just so we can see how the game feels. Last, let's check out Ghosts and Goblins, released in 1986 on the Famicom. You could definitely say this has graphics similar to the original Zelda game. There will definitely be games with better graphics later in the NES life cycle. But this isn't that bad. It's definitely progress on the Super Mario Brothers, but it's still not comparable to Super Mario Brothers 3. The Famicom Mini is an interesting snapshot into history. Its shape, its buttons, how everything is hardwired, shows a different time. It looks a lot more like a toy than the Nintendo Entertainment System was. The things that I don't like about it are the power button, the switch is a little bit hard to push where it's a little bit scary, you think you might break it, and the controllers. The controllers, with their size, it hurts to use it long term. My four year old doesn't like it either, so I don't think they're actually good for anyone. The game selection is okay. If you are an American, the games that you do know, a lot of them are going to be different, and that's actually a lot of fun. There are some games that you might enjoy that weren't on there, like River City Ransom, but, but that might be hard for the Japanese because you need to know where to go next and you, can't, you might not be able to read it. So my final thought for this is that the Famicom Mini is a lot like peanut butter, and the Nintendo Classic Mini is a lot like jelly. You probably don't just want one of them, they go together really well. So with that, Three, I give it a... Two, one. Out of five minutes. I guess I can use it if you really want me to. In the next few videos, I'm going to be looking into how to hack the system. I think we can improve it a lot and I'll be giving it a new review at the end. We can put some Bluetooth chips in there to allow Bluetooth controllers. That's probably not going to help with the lag, but it will make it a lot easier to play. After that, we'll be looking into how to hack the system, customize the games, and we'll see if we can put anything else on there. So, if that sounds interesting to you, stick around. I think we're going to have a lot of fun. Catch you all in part two. See you later.